Welcome once again. I believe there are people rolling in through our waiting room and that's fine. We'll just continue to keep the door open as we do on Seder night. Ah, and so Audrey, thank you. Um, yeah, we just wanna make sure that our other presenter is able to be with us, Sam Swire. Here he is, he's right here, okay. Welcome everyone, we'll get started now. We have an opportunity tonight as the sun is almost finished setting on this Rosh Chodesh Nisan, this first day of the first month of the year, the first day of the, the month that will usher in spring and of course also this amazing holiday that we have. Uh, we have an opportunity to gather tonight and open the Haggadah in some ways that we maybe haven't done before and look a little more deeply at certain segments of it, certain passages. I'd like to begin just singing a little bit with you uh, the words to the melody I was just noodling on just, just a moment ago. These are the words. <laughs> Begin with these words. These are uh, words to a folk song. I'll just leave them up here for a second. Uh, folk song that many people sing on Seder night. And they're meant to connect us uh, with that passage from the Torah, from right at the center of the Exodus story, which, it's, which says, Vayihi b'chatsi halayla. It happened in the middle of the night that the children of Israel began to make their, their departure. And there's a feeling that the middle of the night is like time out of time. And so we sing this song, this folk song with the same feeling that Seder night is as though it's lifted out of the sense of linear time. And we are lifted with it into a feeling of connection with this part of our mythic history. So I'll put these words away now. 
so we can see each other once again. We have three presenters here tonight to teach us a little bit more, a little bit differently, a little bit from their perspective on the central part of the Seder, which we know as Magid. If we go through the order of the Seder in our mind, or we can practice it, right? It's Rosh Chodesh, time to practice. Magid. And that's where I wanted to pause this evening and see if we can open up that one part of the Seder a little more and why. Partially it's because it's one of the oldest traditions we have, oldest religious traditions we have in our religious history. It says in Exodus chapter 13, verse eight, Vihigadita Levincha, you will tell this story to your children. It says it right in the Torah. Vihigadita, the same word as Magid, Lehagid, to tell. And the commandment is, as we know, to tell every year, to tell and retell. And in the telling is a kind of rediscovery, even for those of us that have been around for many Sadarim. There's a kind of rediscovery, and I also believe a kind of healing that's here for those of us that choose to dip in. So we turn to this central Magid section. Uh, also wanna just bring up this marvelous sense of history. So the, the, we just invoked that verse from the Torah, Vehigadita Levincha from chapter 13 of Exodus. And then we also know that the tradition of telling the story is at least as old as Second Temple times. So we're talking about probably the end of the sixth century, beginning of the fifth century BCE. Our people have been sitting around together and the, the more stylized, formalized Seder with the Karpas and the, uh, the salt water and all of that maybe came a little bit later, but the telling is as old as our people. And of course, just to end up my introduction, we're familiar with the commandment that says, you must tell the story and everyone who expands on it is worthy of praise. And so every generation has to add its own perspective and its own insights. Tonight, we're going to turn to David Silverman, to Sam Swire, and to Ami Weintraub. And we'll go in that order. And I've asked each of them to choose a section of the Magid to, to teach us and to discuss with us, to share with us how they understand it, each of them. And also, if, if they're willing, to share with us a little bit about how their own perspective on those passages have evolved over time. Uh, we have among our three teachers, one who is a beloved and veteran teacher in our community, David and two who are newer voices, uh, younger teachers who have their own insights about these passages. So um, I'm just gonna turn to each of the three of you can introduce your own section. And I believe Audrey's given you screen sharing uh, permission. Yes. So David, we're going to you first and take it away. And sorry, I was just gonna say, we'll ask each of the three presenters to take, um, I asked them to take five to seven minutes to present what they have, and then we'll have time for conversation with each of them. All right. Thank you, Rachel. So I'm going to actually talk about the very opening lines of the Magi, the Halakma. Uh, and if there's time, also talk about the last line, the call door to door, which is sort of the bookends of the Magi. Uh, but let me start. Uh, with start with with halakma, uh, and I sort of I thought I'd start. Uh, my Ari Milson, who's made Aliyah, came home for Pesach a couple of years ago, and he brought us you know, this, a Haggadah, which is called the Unbound Haggadah. It's uh, by an, art, an Israeli artist named Eli Kaplan Wildman, uh, and I thought I'd share the way 
he illustrated these passages as a sort of way in. Uh, so give me one second here. Yeah. And so David, while you're getting this set up, just in case Thank anyone's you. not familiar with the, the original language, the Aramaic, ha lachma anya. I'm gonna put that up in a second too. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, just uh, couldn't resist. This is uh, one of my favorite little passages here. Uh, can everybody see, can you see the screen? Is that, is that coming through? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me now, but. Oops. Uh, so he, this is the way he illustrates the beginning of the Magid. And he explains that sitting through the Magid is like a ticket to a front row seat for the best, I'm quoting here, to the best story ever told, but that the way it is told does not conform to any linear order. There is no chronological, geographic, or character-related logic behind the jumps between Magid's various parts. Uh, and that's clearly, I mean, that's true, and I think the halakma that we're going to be looking at illustrates that. So this is the these are the words we'll go and we're going to, I'm going to sort of walk through them uh, try to, because I think in these handful of verses captures so much of what Pesach means to me at least. So the first verse, Halakma Anya, the Ahalo of Avatano, to his Mayim, this is the bread of poverty or some translated affliction that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. So that's not at all the way we think about matzah, right? We think about matzah as the bread that we ate as we were coming out of Egypt. Uh, and in fact, at the very towards the end of the Magid, we're going to read Robin Rabbi, Gabriel, who's going to contradict this and talk about how matzah we eat matzah because there wasn't time for the dough to rise, the traditional explanation. Uh, but here, the halakma puts it in a very different way. And I would say this to me at least, this is illustrating that, uh, or to the reminding us that Passover, Pesach, the Seder is not just about telling the story and not just about remembering the story. It's really about reliving. It's about trying to put ourselves in the story and make it our own in a way that's more than just st storytelling. And part of that is actually, we have to experience the matzah differently. We are going to go through a Seder where it starts out as the bread of affliction and it's going to come out as the bread of liberation as we go through this transformation. I, there's a Moroccan tradition that at this point in the Seder, the, we are just broken the, the Afi, broken the matzah and the Afi Komen, which is not hidden in the Moroccan tradition, would be passed over everybody's head uh, as to sort of bring them into the slavery. Then we come to this amazing second verse let all who are hungry come and eat. Uh, important to note, this is in Aramaic. It was written in the vernacular so that everybody who heard this would understand this. There are some traditions which would open, in some traditions, the door is opened at this point in the Seder, not just for, the, for Elijah later in the Seder, but it's opened at this point as well. Uh, so that this invitation comes through to anybody who can hear it. Uh, Rabbi Sachs, I'm going to share a couple of uh, sort of, Rabbi Sachs has written, I thought, quite beautifully about this, about this verse. Uh, and if you'll forgive me, I'll just read this because I think it's quite powerful. Uh, he writes, what a strange beginning and strange invitation this is, offering the hungry the taste of suffering. But sharing food is the first act through which slaves become free human beings. One who fears tomorrow does not offer his bread to others. The willingness to divide one's food and share with a stranger is that beginning of fellowship and faith from which hope is born. That's why we begin by inviting others to join us. Bread shared is no longer the bread of affliction. Uh, and you can see, I won't read these to you, but uh, this is from Erica Brown. Uh, and I'm, I forget where this last one is from, but all, all sort of playing off on this theme of let all who are hungry come and eat. But then not just let all who are hungry come and eat, the, the, the verse concludes, let all who are in need come and share the Pesach meal. So some invitation, not just for 
those who are physically hungry, but those who have other needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs. We invite them all into the Seder as part of, that's part of the message here. And I would say this year, particularly, who among us is not one who is in need uh, and for whom this invitation does not resonate. And then, of course, you come to the, the conclusion, Hashata Hacha L'Sana Haba'a, Biyarit Yisra'el, Hashata Avdei L'Sana Haba'a B'nei Chorin. This year we're here, next year in Israel. This year we're slaves, next year free people. And that, again, sort of to think about what it means to say, now we are slaves. And so one can think about that at the sort of political, social level, and think about how that none of us are truly free so long as anybody is enslaved and what enslaved, what the various ways in people can be physically enslaved. Or we can think about this more in psychodynamics terms and think about the ways each of us is in our own narrow place, our own Mitzrayim, and that we're all slaves. Uh, in Rabbi Kaplan's Haggadah, the new Haggadah, he followed this passage in uh, the Halachma with these words, talking people can be enslaved in more ways than one. We can be enslaved to ourselves. And then at the end, Pesach calls upon us to put an end to all slavery. Passover cries out in the name of God, let my people go. Pesach summons us to freedom. So as I say, to me, in these four or five verses capture so much of what Pesach is all about and a brilliant beginning of the Magid. And I guess I have time to, and then at the very end, so the other end of the bookend, the last paragraph of the Magid, which leads into the into Halel, it begins with the famous verse, Bechol Dor Vidor. Uh, and there are two versions of it. So the one we're probably most familiar with is the Ashkenazi version. Uh, and it's interesting, it's Bechol Vodor Adam. So it's every person, it's not every Jew, uh, not every Israel, Israelite, anything like that. It's every person must see himself or herself as if they personally left Egypt. And then the Sephardic version changes the verb. And so in each and every generation, each one must show oneself or conduct oneself as if they personally left Egypt. And this is the verse that Rabbi Toba Spitzer in the Reconstructionist Haggadah describes as not just the heart of the Seder, but as the heart of, heart of Judaism, but certainly captures, I think, everything what we're trying to convey in the Seder. So with that, I will stop, Rachel. Thank you, David. Actually, um, here's what I'd like to do, if, if it's okay with everyone. Um, I'm going to ask you, David, in a second, if you'd put Halach Ma'anya back up in front of us. I'd like to sing it with you all. I don't, I always find um, pe some people are familiar with singing it, some people not. In this case, it's singing, not just for the joy of singing, but because it's a way to put the words in your mouth in a way that's easier than just reading them, I think. Um, and then I'd like to um, pause here before we go to Sam and see if there are any questions or comments about this, these passages that David has, has presented to us. The opening, Halach Ma'anya, and the closing, Bechol Dor Vador. So join me, please. Let's just sing through this. Um, I meant to say in my introduction, I came across a commentary that said, uh, starting on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, you can start telling the story. So that's tonight. That's today. Um, so we're, we, can, we can start practicing right now. Uh, so this is the version that I know. Halachma, halachma an yadi achalu, achalu avahatana be'ara be'ara de mitzrayim. Be'ara be'ara de mitzrayim. Gold it's in Ha 
And that, that melody is recorded on our website also, uh, if anybody wants to find it. So thank you, David. Let's just open it up here for a little bit and see if there are any questions, comments, things people want to um, check in about this particular section. I have a question. Go ahead, Stan. Well, it, 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 uh, David, uh, thank you very much for that wonderful uh, explanation. Uh, but uh, you ended with saying we should conduct ourselves as if we um, left Egypt. And I was wondering what exactly that meant, because um, the folks who left uh, Egypt didn't necessarily conduct themselves very well, mm -hmm. uh, as we all know, the golden calf and complaining all the time and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, how do you what would you say one had to do to live up to what clearly uh, you know, it was meant to be a better way of conducting oneself. So what, what does it exactly mean to conduct oneself as if we left uh, Egypt? Great. Thank you, Stan. David, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I guess to me, Stan, uh, it is this notion of, I'm not the preaching to the choir here, right? That uh, we are told that we have to, uh, how we treat the stranger because we understand the soul of a stranger. We were strangers. So it is to experience the notion of if one one is a slave. Now it's true, you're right, that some people come out of slavery and they say, uh, hey, we made it, why didn't everybody else make it? And you take a superior attitude and and but it is, I think, to try and create a sense of empathy and there but for the grace of God go I, and that therefore it creates a set of obligations on us, mm -hmm. is the way I understand it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Hey, thank you. Maybe one, if there's one more, Jamie, go ahead. Jamie Bank. I had, yeah. I had an opportunity this week to study, uh, to attend a women's Torah study session where our teacher, Eliza Sperling, uh, gave an alternative um, interpretation of the phrase lechem oni, which I guess is the same, same yes. wording as lach. Ma, ma anya. Mm -hmm. And she said it could be translated as the bread over which there is an, there are answers. Um, oh, the bread uh -huh. over which one answers. Yeah. And I thought that was, and we talked about the all of the various questions that are posed in the course of the Seder. So I just wanted to share that and, and to ask if you had also heard that or read of that interpretation. And I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, that's great. David, do you want to I've ne no, I've never heard that. I'm fascinated by it, but uh, I've, uh, none of the Haggadot I've ever seen is translated other than other than poverty or affliction. Yeah, I, I would say so too. But it's a beautiful play on the words "la anot" in Hebrew is to answer. So, and I really say, should attribute it to Eliza Sperling because it may yeah. be. I don't know if it's her original interpretation, but I just want to mention she's the one who. Yeah, who I mean. Our Haggadah, the Reconstructionist Movement Haggadah is called a night of questions. So it's fitting that you would want to say, here's the bread with some answers. Kol HaKavod to her, to Lisa. Excellent. Okay, let's, uh, let's save, if there's any more discussion on this particular piece, let's save it for now. So I want to go ahead now to Sam Swire, who we invited here tonight. And I see you, Sam, and you can explain what you're going to be sharing. Yep. Hi folks. Um, first off, thank you, Rachel and Audrey and Adat Shalom for inviting me. Um, this is a cool and uh, it's been especially thought provoking week um, preparing for Passover. And the, the portion that I, the part I want to focus on was the wicked child. Um, and I think dovetails well um, after David's portion. Let me just share my screen. Here we go. So, Sam, just for just in case there's anybody that's not familiar, just put put the wicked child in the context of that. Sure. So, um, about one third of the way through the Magi, um, we start talking about these four children who have questions, and then we give answers, different answers than than um, you know the, the four questions, um, the Manishtana, mm -hmm. and. Um, 
my experience reading this over the past um, uh, 20 years or so has been pretty much negligence, I would say. I would, um, the Wicked Child is always, in my experience, a conundrum and uh, something that I read. And I don't really understand what is happening, especially if I'm reading it in Hebrew very quickly or even in English. Um, it's kind of esoteric, the language is kind of strange and it's not particularly nice or, or seemly passage. And so I, you know, I read it um, and I strive not to be some abstract version of wickedness that um, is being described here, which I don't entirely understand. And then I move on and I see the wise child or I see the one who doesn't know how to ask. I see the simple one. I'm like, that feels like it would be um, a better, better model of a, of a person, not a child to be. Um, but I think that this year, I reading it more slowly without the sort of pressure of being hungry at 9.30 at night, um, I was struck by just how much I wanted to kind of gloss over this and then struck again by how much I felt like I really need to slow down and actually read what is being talked about here. Um, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes just going through, you know, who is this wicked child? And, and I think um, more tangibly for us today, um, you know, what does it mean to be a wicked child and how does that bear upon us? So just to read it together. Um, what does the uh, wicked child say? What is this worship to you or to you all really, to you all and not to him, him being God. And since they excluded themselves from the collective, they're a denier of a principle of the Jewish faith. And accordingly, you, you will blunt their teeth um, or edge their teeth as an alternative translation and say to them, for the sake of this, did God do this for me in my going out of Egypt, for me and not for them? If they had been there, they would not have been saved. And I think one thing that really struck me slowing down and reading this was that it is an incredibly harsh response. Um, there's no love or affection or desire to teach. It's just, um, first, first off, after the question, it's just the rabbi saying, this person is not even a part of the Jewish people. And then after that, they say you should blunt their teeth. And then after that, they say, this is how you should respond. Um, so it's like an escalation of, of recourse, which made me feel uncomfortable. And I think one of the reasons that I felt uncomfortable was because um, the other three children, it's very easy to identify with uh, what is being represented. And with the wicked child, it, it feels very easy to disidentify or to distance yourself from, especially the answer. And so the answer I, I you know, is a little bit dark, a little bit strong, um, makes me uncomfortable. I, you know, I, curious to hear other people's thoughts about how they feel about it. Um, I want to put to the side, but I actually want to focus on the question itself because I feel like the question gets lost because we're focused so much on the answer, right? On the, on the depth of the answer. And so, you know, what, what is the, the child actually asking? And so here are the three verses from Exodus. Uh, when you come to the land that God will give to you, um, you know, keep this uh, uvda, um, avuda, um, service, worship, deed thing. Um, this is the question that we saw up top with, with the wicked child. Um, and you shall say it is the sacrifice of God's Passover for God passed over the house of the people of Israel and Egypt. We struck the Egyptians, but Sarah spared our houses and the people bowed their heads in worship. And so I actually found this to be quite interesting because the question actually makes a lot of sense, right? The, the wicked child is asking, Lachem, why is it to you all and not, not to God? Because the verse after is saying, this is you know, the, the, uh, God's Passover. It's not saying this is your Passover, it's saying it's God's Passover. Um, and you know, it seems like the rabbis are just taking this to mean that this person uh, has doubts or is skeptical of you know Passover, you know the miracle, that, all that type of stuff. Um, but I, I guess uh, what I wanted to do, and I think the sort of challenge I want to pose to people is, if we slow down and we ask, actually ask ourselves what is being asked here, I think it's a question that, from a modern standpoint, is a very normal, a very typical question. Um, you know. 
why do we do this? Why is this our practice? Why do, you know, there was once this altar thing, we put a lamb on it, we killed it, and now we eat a lamb at the Seder thing, we tell the story in a language which we don't really speak anymore. Why, why do we do this, right? And so the Rukka child, I think it's a very bad rep given how strong the answer is, but I think the question is actually one that is skeptical and modern and inquisitive and is something that um, I think many of us in this room value as important characteristics and virtues in our lives. Um, and I think in that regard, all of us are in some capacity, the wicked child. We ask these questions, you know, we look at tradition and we say, okay, wh why is it like this? We don't dogmatically accept that which the wise child might accept. Um, so I guess that that is both, um, you know, halachma, as David was saying, everyone should come and eat, but it seems like this wicked child is not someone who we want to come and eat. And to a modern ear, this seems a little bit strange. Um, and I think that this is a, a portion of the Magid, which has, is definitely un uncomfortable for me um, and is one that I think I, this year, moving forward, I would I want to lean into more and being like, okay, guess what? Sometimes I am the the wicked child, and sometimes I am the wise child. But oftentimes, I'm the wicked child, and the wicked child gets a bad rep. But that's just um, you know who we are and what it means to to be modern in the eyes of tradition. So I will end it there. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Um, I think for many people, the, the wicked child is the most interesting. Uh, I think, and of course, as, as I think you wisely just said, we all, we all certainly have been and maybe still are standing in that position. So again, let's just pause here um, and see if there are any, any comments or questions for Sam. Uh, before we do that, bear with me just one second. Uh, I wanted to, again, to just sing a little bit of this with you, but I'm having trouble finding it um, to share, screen share. Well, let's just sing a little bit if, if, you, uh, if you remember the words with me, a little bit. Now, just a, a detour for a second on the question of melody. I'm of the generation, I think, where the Israeli melody, <laughs> which was new at the time, was being brought in to replace what, um, what was used for many generations, which is the, the melody that's used for studying Mishnah together. Da, 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 da. Just curious by a show of hands, how many people grew up? So no, and some people are saying no. Um, and then do you remember at a certain point, I mean, I remember being taught, oh, now we're going to do a new melody. I wasn't very old, but I was old enough to remember. Um, I don't know, Beth Sperber Ritchie, could I put you on the spot and I invite you to lead us in just maybe that opening question? As the youngest child, mm -hmm. had to do that number of times. Yeah. Now we all join. Great, thank you. And I just, I should explain, I often in my mind link up the four questions with the four children and of course the four cups. So that's Sam, how I got to the four questions from where you just took us. Okay, so let's pause for a minute and see what questions or thoughts are coming up for Sam around the Russia, the quote unquote evil child, or Sam, if it's okay with you, if people have thoughts about any of the four children. Could I, could I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Ralph, please. Yeah. Um, so, so if we can skip to the other questions, I always had a trouble between the simple son and the son that didn't know enough to ask. Uh -huh. That those two were, were pretty similar. Mm -hmm. So just forcing it to have four to be like the other parts of the Seder. Right. Sam, right. any insight into that? What the difference is between the simple one and the, and the child who doesn't know how to ask? Yeah, they, they seem pretty similar. Um, hmm. 
Ralph, there are three, there are four times in the Torah where the Torah says what you should say to your son. Three of them are preceded by when your son asks. And so there are three questions. And the one, the rabbi said, well, there's, if we have a fourth answer, there's no question. That must have been the child who did not know how to ask. <sighs> You can think about this if you want, if you think about it in reverse order, that we all progress from being the one who can't ask to being simple, to being rebellious, and if we're really lucky, to reaching wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just have these in the wrong order. Thank you. I guess I would look at it a little bit differently. My experience has been that the one who is simple sees the Seder and just, you know, is okay with it, right? Like, right, this, this, is, this is what it is. Um, you know, there's not, you know, wisdom pulling one way, there's not wickedness, quote unquote, pulling another way. Um, it, it's not like erudition pulling you one way. She's like, okay, this is what life is and I'm just gonna follow it. Whereas the one who doesn't know how to ask, I think is more in a state of wonder, experiential, emotional wonder. And because of that, doesn't feel the need to ask and it's just absorbing it as like a experience in itself. And so, this sort of, I, I have imagined it as the, the simple, sorry, the one who doesn't know how to ask is actually probably closest to what the Israelites were, were experiencing when they were in Egypt, where there's all this stuff happening, you know, lightning and boils and all this stuff. And like, you don't even know how to ask or reconcile with what is happening. And you're just experiencing it. And then suddenly you're crossing a sea and now you're in the desert and you're coming a little bit unhappy. Um, but really that, that sort of initial sort of, um, wondrous state has been how I have seen the difference between you know, taking it for what it is and accepting it versus being in a state of aw awestruck. Mm. Thank you, Sam. Beautiful. I'm listening to you and just feeling reminded of um, just this notion that not every uh, experience becomes verbal. Not everything that we're feeling naturally translates into language for all of us, at least. And to honor the the different ways of being, including the simple, the simple child and the one who doesn't know what to ask. Maybe one more question, comment on the children, the, the evil child or any of the children. I'm just scrolling through to see. Phyllis had something in the chat. Yeah. Yes, Phyllis, do you want to say? Have we lost you? No, I just, I wrote it because I love the variance of how children are described. And I love putting it into today's context. I don't know how Sam got evil. Uh, I he think knows it. But I'm, I'm just grateful. I put my own little story in and I suspect others would as well. To me, the child who doesn't speak is the one who represents the bystander. And that is such a significant presence in today's world. Mm. And uh, the simple child, that's such a judgment, expecting having one perception of what, what spoken word is. There are many, many of our young children who at any age already have learning and living differences. So. Mm -hmm. That's the way I've tweaked it. Spoken like a true educator. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Phyllis. Can, uh, can I add one thing, Rachel? Because I, I mean, yeah, go ahead, please. What Sam said was, you know, so right on about, and I think it's even more profound if you look at the question that the the rabbis go off that this this evil child has asked, used the second person and said, what does this mean to you? Mm -hmm. The question that the wise child asked is also in the second person, mm -hmm. and it asks about you too. Mm -hmm. uh, so one could say that the difference between the two is not the questions, but the people, the labels that are attached to them. Right. It's, the, it's the, label, the labeling that is the problem rather than the questions. Yeah. I thought you were going to say the difference isn't the language, but the tone of voice used. What does this mean to you? As opposed to, tell me, what does this mean to you? Uh, thank you, David. I want to just add um, another thought about the wicked child. Um, you know, you're, I think all of you on this call tonight are familiar with this notion that our, our tradition has the, the concept of the Yetzer Hara, 
and the Yetzer Tov, the Yetzer Hara being the evil inclination and the Yetzer Tov being the, the good inclination or as, as Rabbi Ira Stone teaches, one is the inclination towards the self, the selfish inclination and the other is the, the impulse to serve the other. Um, Ra and Rasha are not the same word, but I'm putting them in the same box for the moment. There's so much in our tradition that says actually the Yetzer Hara, the evil impulse, when properly positioned in our inner architecture is essential. It's essential to our character. It's essential to, for us to be able to be viable in the world. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to live without it. And there's something of the same thing in the in these depiction of these four children at the Seder. We, we don't want the Rasha, the evil one, to become completely defined by being evil. But in the, the rebelliousness, in the what you know, what, what unfortunately is called evil child, is the opportunity for the story to get refined and clarified, just like when somebody comes to you with a challenge. It forces you to clarify, well, what do you mean? And why is this important to you? And so we have to look at it as an opportunity for that person who's asking to learn, but also for ourselves to get clearer about what it is we mean when we say this or that. So thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Okay, deep breath, everyone. We're going to transition now away, from, I believe, Ami, if you're going to correct me, away from the traditional text of the Haggadah and into some midrash about some of the missing parts um, and including you know one half of the human species which often goes silent in our tradition so Ami will turn it to you to explain what, what, what it was that I was just trying to say yes hello everybody and thank you Rachel and Audrey for inviting me uh, and Sam it's so good to see you again after many years and David was one of my Hebrew school teachers so it's good to teach now alongside him um, yeah, I'm Ami and I live in Pittsburgh and I'm a first year rabbinical student with Aleph um, and I'm yeah very excited to be teaching. And what I wanted to teach about tonight is how to listen to the voices that are often left out of our tradition. Um, sorry, let me just go to speaker view. And I think that we do a lot of this, especially in the Reconstructionist community of how to bring in the voices of marginalized people to all that we do to make sure we're inclusive. But I want to um, shift our, or teach tonight a practice for a new way possibly to listen that comes from um, the text itself as well. Um, so I have been a writer for many years of my life, and I'm also a Hebrew school teacher. And last year, I was looking at my curriculum that I get to create for my first grade students. And I was posed with the question of, it's time to teach Torah. What am I going to teach these children <laughs> about Torah? And I decided that I wanted to really focus my um, Torah teaching on teaching the voices of women because if I could give first graders a foundation of Torah that is a feminist uh, foundation that uplifts the stories of women, why not take that opportunity to do that? Um, and so I decided for myself that I was going to, I was looking all over the internet for the stories of women that are good for children to be able to teach them from the Torah. And there was almost nothing that I could find. If anyone has that resource, please send it to me. <laughs> I couldn't find it. So I decided I was going to write these midrash for myself um, and write them in a way that would reach a six-year-old. And the way that I like to write um, is I focus on the subject I wanna write about and then I let images just come to me. So instead of it being a process that feels like it's in my mind, it feels like it's a process that's very much my heart and opening and allowing myself to receive stories that are out there that I just maybe haven't heard yet. And so when I was thinking about um, the story of Exodus, there's so much in the story about the heart. And throughout the entire story, we're being told that Pharaoh's heart is hardened, his heart is hardened and stiff. And that is one of the reasons why the Israelites can't be free is because his heart can't receive 
and his heart cannot open to their stories and to their cries. And in the Jewish tradition, the heart is so interesting, Lev, it doesn't have the same connotations as it does in our Western culture. The Lev in Jewish tradition is not just the place of emotion, but also the place of intellect and the place of the mind. And so for me, it's, it feels like a reflection of how I like to write. When I open my heart, it's not just so I can feel these stories, but so that I can also somehow take it in through my mind as well. So the heart for me is this place of intuition and this place of knowing in a sort of synesthetic way through multiple different modalities. We know through hearing, or we, we see through hearing, we hear through seeing, we feel and we know at the same time all combined into one experience that I think we're kind of cut off from in our general culture because we don't have that same conception of mind and heart being combined. Um, so I wanna take us through a bit of a practice to open our hearts, to be able to hear the stories of marginalized people within the Exodus um, story through our hearts and through the softening of our own hearts. And to see that practice of softening our hearts um, to be able to receive stories as a way for us to um, find freedom for ourselves, for the parts of ourselves that are marginalized and for those in our community who are marginalized. Um, okay, let me look down here. So, uh, so what I thought was really interesting also in relationship to this is in the story of Exodus, there's a part the, before the very last plague um, where God says to Moses, um, God says to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you in order that my marvels may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And then it ends with the eternal stiffened the heart of Pharaoh. And the phrase lo, like Pharaoh will not heed you is lo yishma, Pharaoh will not hear, hear you. And then it connects back again to his heart because his heart is stiff. So this is kind of where I'm getting this idea of perhaps it's not through opening our ears, but through opening our hearts that we're actually able to hear in this new way. And throughout the Torah, there's all of these moments of this sort of synesthesia occurring where um, you expect someone to hear something, but instead, they're seeing something. In the second creation story in Genesis 2.19, in the part where God comes and brings um, Adam to name all of the children, or to name all of the animals, it says, Lirot ma yikralo, God is coming to see what um, Adam is calling all of the animals. So there's this mixture of seeing what is being spoken. And of course, we also have the moment at Mount Sinai where there's the children of Israel are seeing the thunder and hearing the lightning. So that's kind of what I want us to try and embody in one minute, <laughs> this ability to uh, see what we're hearing. So I'll just ask everyone, if you don't mind, to um, perhaps close your eyes. And if you'd like to put your hand on your heart, and if we had a little more time, I would like to sing a little song. Or maybe I will just do that anyways. <laughs> okay, I'll sing this little song um, to sort of bring us into the place where we can let our hearts soften and free. And I'm gonna sing a song that we sing traditionally at the Seder. So what I'm gonna do is I'll sing this song and then I'm gonna read a passage in Hebrew and then I'm gonna read it in English. And instead of thinking, what does this mean? What am I feeling about this? Just see if you can see it, if you can receive with your softened heart intuitively what the mind and what the emotion are doing together. Yay, 
Vayomer Melech Mitzrayim, the Mael Dot Ivriot, Asher Shem Hachat Shifra, Beshem Hashenit Pua. Vayomer Bail Dechen et Ivriot, Uraiten Allah Avanim, in Ben Hu Vehamiten. Oto vim bat hi vachaya. Batier batirain ham melodot et Elohim. Velo asu kasher diber Elohen. Melech mitzrain mitzrain. Betachayen et hayeladim. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, saying, when you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the birth stool. If it is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, fearing God, did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. I will just sit for one minute and let your heart open. And as you're ready, you can come back. And if you'd like to just jot down, if you have a piece of paper, if you, whatever that felt like, if there anything came, images or sensations or anything like that. Um, and that's over my time now, but that's just a process that I want to share with people because it's a way that I find very helpful to when we're thinking about how to include people who aren't usually included. I think we actually need to think about how we do that, we need new methods to bring people in. We can't keep using the same methods that we've used to build this community already, to build the story already. We have to try something new. And that's why I hope to share this practice so we can perhaps learn to listen in a new way and soften our hearts to find that freedom. So thank you. Thank you, Ami. Can we just see or solicit one or two responses to the imagery of the midwives and that you just gave us and give us a little space to, to integrate into our own Orit? Uh, Orit has something to offer here. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry to jump in. I mean, I can't see you all of a sudden. Where are you? Oh, I'm here. Maybe it'll pop up now. Hello. Yeah. I. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, all of you, for presenting. Um, I, I had a really hard time thinking about Pesach this year, but this is one thing I love about a Dat Shalom. A, to have intergenerational experience to, to help us deepen our experience of Pesach and teaching of it, so thank you. But also that it's not all in our heads and in our minds and intellectual understanding, but you brought it into the body and as a kinesthetic and visual person myself as well, I was very moved by this very short and very profound visualization. Um, I immediately thought about uh, my son, Gili. It turned 19 today. He's our second born, but he's our son. So I imagined, you know, 
like if he would have been killed, you know what I mean? And taken away. And so right away, I just, he came up for me, even though he's not here with us. Um, so it was just beautiful. And um, thank you for, for, for letting us open our hearts and having that be part of Pesach. It's not all in our heads and on paper and in the books. It can also be somehow in our bodies. So thank you so much. Thank you, Orit. Pam, is that you? Yes. Yes, it is. So I actually um, wanted to say something about Halachma, but now after Ami's presentation, I feel like it's connected a lot to what she was just getting us to experience. Mm -hmm. um, so as a child and still today, the melody for Halachma I never have like analyzed it or read about it, um, but it always was, had this real mystery to me. And I sing the end of it. We learned it differently than the way you sing it, Rachel. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to sing the end. And when Ami was talking about, you know, like experiencing something through sound mm -hmm. and then seeing something, when I was little and still today, I always thought that Halachma was so different from all the other things that we sing that so many of them are like ilu hotsi hotsi yanu or you know like they're so easy to sing they're so accessible but halachma is so mysterious and the part that is really different from the way you sing it Rachel I'm going to just sing the end yeah. okay um Lishana haba, Lishana haba abirate Yisrael, Hashata of day, Lishana haba bene horin. And part of why it doesn't end, it's not resolved. And yeah. that always, like, it sort of almost scared me, but it was like, I felt like this door was opening and the whole idea of like, we're still slaves, but maybe next year we'll be free. And it's sort of like this endless hallway or something that I mm. saw as a child and it's just stayed with me. Mm. So mm. that's my two cents. Thank you. Do sing that ending again. Um. Ashata. Of day, Lishana Haba Bene Horin. Yeah, yeah. It's it's to our Western ear, it's unresolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for maybe just one or two more. Oh, if anybody else Ralph wants, to. Hand is up in yeah, go ahead, Beth. And sorry, Audrey, what what is Ralph Nitkin? And Ralph Nicken. Okay, Beth, go ahead and then Ralph. Um, I just, when, Ami, when you were doing that, uh, that thing, the, the process, two things came up for me. One is that we, we sort of disconnect mental health and physical health. We disconnect mind and heart. And so, you know, as a professional listener, I found that to be a very powerful experience. Um, but the thing that came up for me was that Shifra and Pua we're making a choice over and over again. And that, it, that um, you know, speaking truth to power or, or fighting the system or trying to change the system or doing, that it's a daily choice. It's an over and over again choice. So that, that each time they looked at that birth stool, mm -hmm. the visual for me was the two of them, I don't know, I imagined what they look like at the, looking at that birth stool and saying, okay, what am I gonna do right now? And that for me was just really like, oh, it's it's every day, it's over and over again. We have to make that choice. Thank you for sharing that. And I I'm excited to if people also want to um, email me things that they that came to them because I think that I've never done this with a group this big before, and also with people with so many different experiences. And I am excited. Like I've that's what I think is so powerful about this type of listening through our hearts is we can actually uncover more of the story that way. Cause I, I never thought about, or I never felt that or I never saw that when I read this and I think there's a power in, and that's why we tell this out loud mm -hmm. um, so that we can hear all of these different 
um, ways that we receive the story. So yeah, if people want to share, I'm happy to hear more after this as well. Thank you, Ami. And actually, Sam and David, if you'd be willing, I mean, David, we have your, anybody who has an adoptable and roster has your email address. Um, but if Sam, if you would be willing to share your contact um, info in case anybody wants to loop back with you, if you're willing, um, that would be great. Great, thank you. Hey, Ralph, Ralph had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Ralph. Yeah, so so I, I mean, I, I want to thank you for 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 that meditation because it really does fulfill bringing us back to that time as if we were there. Mm -hmm. And I realized how, how how contemporary that message is. Because uh, as a country, we've gotten this incredible whiplash from dealing with with a, with a former leader who was more pharaoh-like, if we if we dare say, more trans transactional, to somebody who is now more spiritual and and very much connected to that message you're giving. So as we're experiencing that coming out, that whiplash ourselves in the last two months, <laughs> I think it's a very contemporary message as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Jeff has a comment. Great. Okay, Jeff Weintraub, we're going to give you the last word. Oh, boy. Um, well, in a way, there's a connection between all these three presenters that uh, uh, Shifra and Pua were very much the rebellious ones who were fighting against whatever the system was. Hmm. Um, and, and I think what Sam was trying to point out is that we shouldn't just dismiss and disparage the 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 uh, rebellious ones because they have something to say to us. And ultimately, to David's point, they um, you know it's all about seeking freedom and, and bringing us to that place of of freedom. Um, so uh, those are the, the the dots that I connected through, between the among Thank the three. you, knitting it all together. So, um, I'm sure you all plan that. Oh yeah. Uh, so but just before we close up here for tonight, um, David, Sam, and Ami as well, even though you just uh, had a chance to share, just wondering if there's anything else you wanted to bring up, anything that you brought with you tonight. If not, it's totally fine. We, we have more than enough to chew on. But um, I have to be honest and say I asked each of you to think of like five to seven minutes telling myself, well, they're not going to listen to five to seven minutes. Um, but you were so so uh, careful about your timing. Um, so just wanted to loop back to you to see if there was anything else you wanted to say or anything else you want to ask about. Nothing more for me. Okay. Sam? I, I, yeah, I had one uh, brief thing, just going back to the text of, of the wicked child. Um, there's this very weird idiom um, blunting your teeth, which shows up, and um, it's it's an idiom that shows up a couple of times um, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And the the full idiom is a parent who eats a sour grape. You know, essentially, their their child will have blunted teeth, and it it's a rather grim, kind of gloomy um, couplet, and not particularly uh, nice imagery. But I, I did. The one thing I want to add is that um, what, the part that's being left out here is the parent. It's just the child being talked about, not the parent. And I think it raises an interesting question about um, the, the parent is implicated in the wickedness of the child in the same way that the child is implicated in the wickedness of the parent's iniquity or sin that shows up in a lot of ways. And if we assume that the person responding to the wicked child is the parent, part of the wickedness of the child is because of the parent. And so there is a more, um, I'm not sure if symbiotic is the right word, but reciprocal nature of how the wickedness of the child comes about. It's like, well, if the child is wicked, the parent's also a little bit at fault for that. So how do we reconcile with that? So I guess another sort of um, language-based um, observation I had when I was going through this that I thought it uh, is interesting um, just to think about of it's not really just the wicked child, it's also the whole family structure being mm -hmm. talked about here. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Another food for thought. Thank you, Sam. There's so many uh, different things to bring up. Uh, our tradition has a lot to say about the 
the um, the sins of the of the parents being visited, the punishment for them being visited on the generations to come, and uh, of course the reciprocal of that, which is that the the future generations are forgiven. Um, and I'll just say on a personal note, listening to you, I'm so aware of catching myself with my own, when my own kids do something great, I think, well, it's because we raised them right. And when they do something less than great, I think, well, it's too bad. They just didn't turn out, you know, I take no responsibility. You're lucky, um, Rachel. My kids say to me, don't blame me. It's the fault of the people who raised me. If I did, if I did anything, right, I right, right, right. I'm sure that, and I'm sure that's the, that's part of it too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much, David, Sam, Ami, uh, for giving us this uh, way of warming ourselves up into this marvelous and demanding holiday. I would like to end again. Okay, I had one last quick thing. Go ahead, go ahead, Ami. Oh, just really quick, um, not to be self-promoting, but just because it might be interesting. I'm gonna attach um, the Midrash that I've written for, um, for the Exodus story specifically, it's like all the story through like the perspective or by centering the women and their rebellion. And it's kind of written somewhat more for kids, but I think it still applies for people of all ages. And if you use it at your Seder, if you read it, let me know. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, but I just want to include that so we can start that process of um, bringing in the marginal voices more. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Everyone, really great to see all of you. I was, I'd like to just end by singing what we sing at the end of the Seder. That Jerusalem is gonna be ours to enter in a state of, of elevation. And that somehow part of our participation in this annual ritual is eventually to bring about that messianic potential that we all are pointing towards. In, in this time and in all times. I uh, wanna see if I can, yeah, let's see if I can show you this. <coughs> From one of our favorite family Hagado. So join me please. Lishana haba, Lishana haba, Lishana haba, Birushalayim, Lishana haba, Lishana haba, Lishana haba, Birushalayim, Lishana haba. Leshana ba birushalayim, leshana ba, leshana ba birushalayim, leshana ba, leshana ba, leshana ba birushalayim, leshana ba, leshana ba. Lishana ba birushalayim. Amen and keni hiratzon. And I would like to add a wish that this year be a year that we could actually dream about being in Israel next year. Ah. Pandemic yes. finally softens enough for us to be able to move around the, the globe as we wish. Everyone stay well, please, and stay in touch. And Chodesh Tov, may it be a Nissan of good things for all of us and for all the world. Laila Tov. A thank Lila you Tov. so much to Audrey Lyon for managing everything here for us. Thank you all. Shavua Tov. Shavua Tov. I feel like I want a glass of wine suddenly. You're the manish it's only for you though. <laughs>